Uh, hi everyone. So this is a joint work with uh, Mauricio Suarez. Uh, we, our project is, so we call it probabilistic empiricism. And the idea, roughly speaking, is to develop uh, an empiricist epistemology for probabilities that is based on on my uh, past work. So. Uh, so I published in 2021 a book called <coughs> Modal Empiricism. So the, one of the main aim of this book is to explain how we can acquire knowledge about what is possible or not in this world uh, from an empiricist perspective by experience. So we seem to have a great deal of knowledge about what is possible, but we know uh, that like mundane uh, knowledge, if I if I uh, drop a ball, it's impossible that it goes up. Naturally, it will go down. So it's a kind of uh, of a natural necessity that uh, I decide to accept. So some people are skeptic. I de I decide to be a non-reductionist about it. So there are indeed objective possibilities in the world. Mm -hmm. And in this, this book, I try to explain how we can get to know what is possible or not. Uh, in, in the world by induction on our observation, our experience. I will explain in a minute how this works, but one problem with this view is that it, I briefly mention probabilities in uh, my book, but I, I don't really develop a theory of how it would work for probabilistic knowledge. Uh, and this can be seen as a problem because the fact that lots of models are probabilistic in science is one of the reasons, arguably, to, to think that there are possibilities in the world. And so, well, what we try to do is basically is to fill this gap and to extend uh, model empiricism to, the probabilis to, to probabilities. So, I will present first the non-probabilistic version of modal empiricism. And then I will, I will talk a bit about the interpretations of probabilities and then I will explain how this view could be extended to probabilities. And it's not as straightforward as it could seem, but, uh, but there is a way of making sense of it. And so yeah, by the end, I hope you will be convinced that we can uh, have knowledge of probabilities by experience. So, the, the main idea of modal empiricism is to think in terms of situations, in s possible situations in terms instead of possible worlds. So, let us first focus on applied model. What I mean is a model that is applied to an experimental situation, for example, in order to make predictions. So we have a concrete situation, uh, for example, an experimental situation, and we want to make predictions from our theories. So, uh, the idea is that uh, in such situations, our context, our experimental context, uh, our epistemic context, what we want to know exactly, can be uh, formalized roughly by taking that to be a situation of reference, which is a condition for the experiment to, if, if we think that the experiment is correctly implemented, we have a situation of reference, which is rigid. It's a rigid background for our inferences. We assume that it's there. And then uh, we have a finite, finite partition of coarse-grained possibilities. Uh, which will correspond to a certain focus that we have as experimenters on the situation. We expect, uh, for example, if we measure this or that uh, variable, we expect uh, to obtain this or that result. And in general, we are finite uh, uh, beings, and so this uh, partition of possibilities will be finite. We, we can only discriminate among a finite set of possibilities with our instruments. This, this possibilities, I assume that 
it's very late, so we can describe it using a, a theoretical vocabulary. I, I won't go very deep into this question. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, you can assume that uh, some kind of entity realism. We assume that when we measure spin, it's a property of the system. There is spin out there, there is an electron, it has uh, the properties that it has measurable properties. And of course, this situation and this particular focus, this in particular, this the way <coughs> of dividing the background and uh, and what is fixed in the background and what can vary, and the way of cutting possibilities, uh, the cut of dividing possibility space depends on our interests. It's a certain focus ad adopted by experimenters. And what a theoretical model says in such circumstances, well, it can tell us which among the possibilities that we have delimited are really possible or not. This is the assumption. In part, for example, if you have a situation where you drop a ball and you're only interested in whether the ball will go up, down, or remain at the same height, you apply a simple model of a free fall from classical mechanics, and the model will tell you that only one of these possibilities among the three that you are interested in is, possi is actually possible. It's the one where the ball falls towards the ground. So, so far, what I'm saying is, it's kind of, uh, it's about the semantics of applied models. So that's the semantics of applied models that I assume, what the model says. And then we can say that the model is accurate, it's confirmed, it's not refuted by your observations, if what actually occurs is among what is permitted by the model. It's not among the possibilities that are excluded. So your model passes the test, so to speak. Uh, and then, so the picture that I propose in the, my book, Modern Empiricism, is to start from these uh, experimental situations and to, so to speak, climb up the ladders of abstraction to get at uh, full-fledged theoretical models by understanding them to be indexical. And by this, I mean in quite technical sense that is used in philosophy of language, that their content should be interpreted as functions from context to content. So a theoretical model, like uh, with, with a phase space, a continuum phase space with, a, uh, with continuous variables, should not be interpreted as a direct representation of what there, of what there is in the world, but rather as a function from context Content. And the context is <coughs> what I've just described before, a coarse graining of possibilities, assuming fixed background conditions. And the model can be said to be empirically adequate, which is kind of ideal pursued by scientists. It's not something that we necessarily uh, we can be sure about it. It's more like a regulative ideal for science, the aim of science. Yeah. So a model is empirically adequate if it's accurate in all possible contexts. That is, whatever we could, wherever we could apply the model, it would be accurate. And this includes, for example, if you take a model of free fall that describes a ball, a ball that is dropped, this means that whatever the ball in the world where you would apply your model, if, even if it's a ball that you're not aware of, uh, the model would <coughs> describe uh, what's happening, whatever the focus you could have on this ball. And also, uh, and also if the ball is not actually dropped, well, it could extend as well to if it were dropped, then this would happen. So it's an extension of accuracy to the realm of possibilities, possibilities for situations. And so how can we know that 
a model is empirically adequate? That's the question. The question of how do we justify, at least in probability, or how we can be rather confident that a model is empirically adequate. And the story that I give in my book is, well, we know it by simple enumerative induction. Like if I saw, if I see a white swan, two white swans and so on, I can be confident that all swans are white. This is a defeasible inference. There are, maybe there are actually black swans, as, as is the case in the real world. But we can be confident uh, insofar as we haven't seen a black swan that the inference is correct. Uh, and so the idea that we don't need uh, the kind of inferences that are often put forth by uh, realists, the inference to the best explanation, that kind of stuff. It's pure, uh, simple, enumerative induction. And all that we have to assume for this induction to be valid is that our sample is represented, representative of the full set of objects we're interested in. In this case, our sample is constituted of the situations that we observe <coughs> directly, the experiments, and the full set is the set of all possible situations. So if we assume that what we see is representative of what is possible or not for this kind of situation, then we can be confident that our model is modally adequate. And that what it so what it says that is possible or not is objectively possible or not. And as I said before, this concern all dropped balls, observed or not, all balls that could have been dropped, and everything that could happen for these balls. Uh, I'm not, I will not attempt to give a full uh, argument for this view. I'm just presenting it, as you have noticed. <coughs> uh, if you want a full uh, book-length argument, you can read uh, my book. Uh, but just to give an idea of the kind of argument that we could put forth, there's this idea that uh, there's this idea that this representativeness, well, we can think that scientists, when they do experiment, they try, they are trying to get a representative set of all possibilities by their interventions. And this is some kind of, I'm just uh, speaking intuitively right now, so it's not, a, uh, it's not a precise argument, but the idea that the intuition that when they play with parameters, they, they intervene in the world to create artificial situations that are sometimes very far-fetched, what they're trying to do is to get a, a set of situations that is representative not only of what happens, as a matter of fact, but of the possibilities, of all the possibilities. So, so that's what they're after. That's, uh, that's the kind of argument that you could have in mind. But anyway, the point here is just to present this view. So I will ask you to just assume that this is the this is a correct epistemology for uh, uh, model knowledge. So here is a summary to, so that you have everything in mind. So first you have a notion of a context, which is a situation of reference and a partition of coarse grain possibilities. An applied model excludes or permits these possibilities. It's accurate if what is excluded is not is, act, is not actual. Then a theoretical model is a function from context to apply model, and it's adequate if what is excluded in any context is impossible. And how do we know that? We know that because the model is accurate in a representative range of situations, of experimental situations, the experiment of a representative work, a range of contexts. Now let's move to uh, probability. So this view uh, assumes that you have that the model just permit or exclude possibilities. It doesn't 
put any weight of probability on what is more possible or less possible. And that could be seen as a problem because uh, many, many uh, as I said in the introduction, many scientific models are probabilistic and this is one of the reasons to assume that there are possibilities in the world. The fact that models attribute <coughs> objective possibilities to uh, possible outcomes, for example, typically. So how this can be done? Well, first let's review briefly uh, the, the interpretation of probabilities. So the, this is a very large topic with a very large literature, so I will, it will be very uh, summarized. But roughly speaking, there are two broad families of interpretations. You have epistemic interpretations that uh, consider that probabilities are associated with degrees of presence, for example. So they are, so to speak, in the mind of, uh, of the cognitive agent. You have notably subjective Bayesianism or objective Bayesianism. So objective Bayesianism assumes that, uh, that probabilities correspond to some kind of support, of epistemic support from, uh, uh, yes, for, uh, for a proposition, S something like that. Uh, then you have antique interpretations which accept that there are possible objective possibilities in the world. So the world uh, is uh, itself made, made out of, uh, it can be dispositions or things like that. So we see precisely the different interpretations. Uh, one, uh, kind of, one family of interpretation is uh, frequent, fre frequency interpretations of probabilities want to identify uh, the probability with a ratio of uh, observations in the mosaic of the world, typically. You have different family, actual and limiting uh, frequencies. And then you have propensity interpretations. Uh, okay. Uh, Yes. Uh, just a small detail, but uh, you said uh, that the frequency was about um, the, 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 the ratio among all the observations. Then you create like an observation. <coughs> observation. It's not really ontic, right? Uh, well, no. So uh, no. Yeah, I said the ratio among observations. Uh, no, maybe uh, it's <coughs> a wrong characterization. It's a ratio of. Uh, of events, yes. This is more uh, Mauricio's part, so I'm a bit uh, less. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry if it's uh, it's not as precise uh, as it could be. Your empiricism uh, comes through. Sorry. Your empiricism comes through. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's it's more uh, adequate to say a uh, frequency uh, ratio of events of one kind among a set of events of a larger kind. Uh, I won't go into details uh, on this part, but roughly speaking, uh, th what is more in the spirit of modal empiricism is a kind of, well, epistemic views are not really, we can put, it, put them aside because I assume from the start that there are possibilities in the world. So, so if we want to interpret probabilities in the context of modal empiricism, we'll go for an antique view. And then frequentist, uh, is an attempt to reduce the modal <coughs> aspect to something that in the end is not really modal, it's just a repartition of events. And so that doesn't fit very well either with the spirit of, uh, of modal empiricism. And so, so we will assume a propensity view. So the idea that the probability is just an indication of a propensity, how much there is some kind of propensity for a system to, to uh, generate uh, such or such event, for example. And then you have long-run propensity views and single-case propensity views, but then again with this focus on situations, on concrete situations, well, the single-case propensity view is much more, fits much more closely to the spirit of modal empiricism. So roughly that's what we will uh, assume as a, 
an interpretation of probabilities. And then you also have best system analysis uh, that could be compatible uh, with, they are compatible with a single case view. So the idea is that uh, the propensity can depart slightly from the actual frequency in the best, uh, best system analysis. It's not necessarily a problem if there is uh, an overall uh, simplicity of the, of the probabilistic laws. Uh, and again, I won't go into uh, details about this, but we, we can assume that uh, we can assume a single case propensity view. It's the idea that every concrete situation has, objectively speaking, some propensity that is more or less strong to instantiate uh, such or such property or event or, or what have you. So this is, uh, this fits well with uh, Mauricio's complex nexus of chains. So roughly speaking what uh, Mauricio has defended uh, in his uh, recent work is that propensities or dispositions are different from probabilities and chances. And they are different from frequencies, but that we need all of them to really understand what, what's going on uh, when it comes to probabilities. We need the three aspects. Roughly speaking, we could think of it in this way. Uh, probabilities are manifestations of propensities and the frequencies are manifestations of uh, of uh, the probabilities. I hope I'm not, uh, I'm not mischaracterizing uh, his view. Okay. Now let's see how we can <coughs> extend uh, modal empiricism to the probabilistic case. And first, we can see that there is a kind of puzzle, a difficulty to do so. The problem is that it, the problem has to do with simple induction. When you have, you have a model that simply permits or excludes possibilities, so the model say of every concrete instance of a kind of situation, it say this is possible, this is impossible. Then you observe one, two, three situations of this kind and you infer that it's true of all possible, of all situations of this kind that this is possible for them and this is impossible. What is going on here is simply that you extend a property that is true of, that you observe in uh, one of every instance of your set. You say this, pro this, the fact that this does not occur is true of all the situations of my set. So this is basically a projection from uh, the property of instances to the, the whole set. And the problem we have with probabilities is that it cannot work directly like that. So if I uh, toss a coin, for example, and if I have a model of coin toss that tells me that it's half chance, the probability that uh, its head is half, the probability that uh, its uh, tail is its head or tail yeah, is half, well, roughly speaking, the model just permits the two possibilities. And if I get only uh, head uh, trials of the trials, uh, the model is always confirmed because head is always one of the two possibilities. So there is a problem. How can we really infer that the probability is half and not 0 0.3? Uh, the problem, roughly speaking, is that frequencies, which are the manifestation, the empirical manifestation of probabilities are characteristics of groups of events or groups of situations, repeated situations, and not characteristics of every single situation. And so we cannot have the same story of <coughs> just uh, making a difference from what is true for each instance to what is true for all instances. So how can we get out of this puzzle? The solution I propose is to first have a look at how scientists actually test their models in more 
going a bit more into the detail of well, statistical reasoning, basically. And here you have an example that is uh, that I take from uh, Mayo, Deborah Mayo, and Spanos. So they have this concept of severe testing that correspond to the practice of, of scientists. Uh, and what they say is that data X in test T provide good evidence for inferring H just to the extent that H passes severely with X. So the delta you obtain, which is X0 in your test, provide good evidence uh, to the extent that H passes severely. And what does it mean to, pa to pass severely? It means that H would very probably not have survived the test so well if it were false. So it's a bit, uh, it's uh, the formulation is maybe a bit, a bit difficult to pass, but roughly speaking, here's a reconstruction, which is a little bit different, I will explain, but roughly speaking, we can say that a model, so we will talk about models instead of hypothesis. We will transpose this view because general models are tested. A model is discarded, assume that a model is discarded when what it gives very low probability to is actually observed. So if a model can say that this is almost impossible and if you observe it, then your model is wrong. And a model passes a severe test when all alternatives but the model are disca uh, discarded. This is a way of uh, reconstructing the previous sentence. There is a tiny difference which is uh, uh, there is a slight difference because you have to assume that uh, all alternative models are discarded, whereas the Siever test of uh, Mayo is more like uh, the conjunction of all the alternative hypotheses is discarded. So it's a bit, it's a bit stronger. The Siever test version of Mayo and Spaus is a bit stronger. But we'll assume, uh, for the sake of uh, for the sake of our purpose, that it's uh, it's close enough. Uh, if you want it to be uh, closer, you could. Uh, you could just uh, raise the lower the lower the threshold the threshold for a uh, model to be discarded depending on how many models are in competition for example and this is <coughs> this is a nice idea because it can be somehow extended uh, maybe a bit more intuitively to give a notion of robustness the idea that the model is robust in the sense that every alternative to the models that you could think of, you could devise a test for for it and it would be discarded and your model would be would stay uh, confirmed by the experiment. And then you can say that your model passed a severe test when you have tested a broad range of alternatives to your models and they all were discarded in some or other situations. Okay, and what is interesting with this? There is a question. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. but um, I am not sure I understand this completely. It seems that you will always have alternative theories, no? Because I mean, you can so what, yeah, add, of add, add irrelevant elements. Yeah, of course, there are always. Sorry. Uh, irrelevant elements on which the theory, the alternatives will disagree uh, with your. Uh, your first model, so you have to uh, be able to discard them, but they are, the, the, the differences are irrelevant to the problem. You see the point? Well, we can take it to the, to the Q and A. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm not sure. Yeah. If you were saying that there are always alternatives, like I mean, yeah, you cannot exhaust all the alternatives. If that's a point, uh, no, uh, it's no. That that you can always 
like come up with a uh, stronger uh, alternative, a stronger model than the one that makes more irrelevant predictions or has more irrelevant variables in there. Um, so and yeah, but the idea is that if you you can, someone suggests this model then you have to think of uh, a context where the, your two models will make a difference and you have to test mm -hmm. this context in order for the test to be robust. Every time you have an alternative, you have to devise <coughs> an experimental test that would tell apart your alternatives. And of course, it's, you cannot exhaust all the alternatives. So it's, at some point, there are pragmatic aspects that are unavoidable. It's, at some point, it's, well, this model is acceptable beyond reasonable doubt or something like that. Yeah. Because you cannot, you, I mean, at some point you can say, ah, oh, but what if uh, uh, an evil, uh, what if we are in a simulation and so on? I mean, yeah, you can devise a metaphysical alternative. But if we put this kind of worries apart, uh, you could say that your model is uh, past a severe t test beyond reasonable doubt if you've tested like a large range of relevant alternatives. And every time there is an alternative that seems relevant, then you could you can devise a test, design an experiment and see if your model still stands up, stands uh, what's the expression stands up? And uh, and then it passed the severe test. It's kind of an extension of the same idea to, to get the notion of robustness. If I may back on that, uh, like Mayo's uh, epistemology is built to be an anti one, mm -hmm. and so the idea that hypotheses which are clear enough and precise enough that uh, you don't have a lot of uh, possible and considered alternatives, and you don't have the case that Peter was talking about, this is one of the reasons why she can do the sphere artistic stuff. That you don't have like an uh, infinite amount of possible alternatives that you have that you could test, and it's, so it's, it's, the hypothesis is already like, precise enough, it's not the full theory. So. So, uh, so it's, 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 uh, I, I see what you mean, but it's in the, that it needs a lot of more the precise, the precise position to, to be able to do the translation, I suppose. But okay, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm interested in this kind of uh, feedback. If you can uh, maybe tell me more after the, to, to get things a bit more precise, maybe, yeah. But this is the idea. And what, what's interesting with this idea that it's very close to the story I gave in uh, my book, Model Empiricism. Because the idea, if you remember, is to have to test your model in a set of representative contexts that are representative of uh, a range of possibilities, assuming fixed background condition and so on. And, and you can say that your model passed the test if all alternatives are discarded. So it's the same. Roughly, it's the same idea, but but the difference is that uh, in the case of probability, <coughs> it's not the probabilistic model itself that passed the test, but more like a model of a sequence of experiments, and that's an important difference. It's a composite model that that assumes that there are I don't know a hundred, let's say coin toss, there are. 100 coin toss that are statistically independent. So it's part of your assumption that they don't depend uh, one on the other. And so what is really tested is not your model that say the coin is probability, it's half probability that it's tail or head. What is really tested is a model that say, if you run 100 costs, you will get a number with 99% probability, you will get a number of tail that is in between 40 and 60, let's say, in between a range. So the idea is that is that for to make empirical tests, we need dichotomous claims. That I take this formula from a, I didn't put. I'm sorry, I didn't put the reference in the slide from an article that I forgot. <laughs> but the idea is that to really be able to decide whether a hypothesis is true or false or whether a model is uh, adequate or not, you need the model to yield a dichotomous claim. It's yes or no. And then you need to make a test that tells you it's yes or no. You cannot, 
you cannot uh, be content with ah oh, it's a probability half and I got the tail so it's good. No, you have to to build a and to do that you have to build composite models. You have to take your unit model and make models of sequences of events. And with the law of large numbers, assuming a statistical independence, you get a dichotomous claim. So yeah. Yeah. Why did you, did you choose a, a single propensity uh, account of probabilities then if you have to build a large series of events? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure that... The point is that long... Uh, yeah. That's uh, actually that's debatable. That's uh, that's kind of the thing that I. I mean, I would be really. We, we're just in the process of uh, of writing the article, and I think we uh, we are open to possibilities of this kind in with regard to the to the interpretations of probabilities. We are both open to see. <coughs> could work with other theories of probabilities. Uh, so it's possible that someone could give an alternative story that works with, uh, for example, long-run propensities or hypothetical frequencies. But, uh, but uh, let us stick with this idea of single case pro propensities. And in this case, so the, sing the single case propensities would be propensities of the sequence, the full sequence of events, which is uh, a complex situation, composed, constituted of simple situations. That's, that's the idea that you could have. And so we have, if we accept this, then we have, a, we can get to a solution which is very close to the original uh, model empiricism solution, but with probabilities. So the idea is to replace exclusion by the model. The model says it's impossible. We replace this with a very low probability, and we so we could think that there is some kind of threshold that is given by the context. And then we can replace accuracy in all possible contexts. So the idea that we get to uh, adequacy by uh, enumerative induction by accuracy in all, pos in all contexts. Oh, sorry. <coughs> the idea that empirical adequacy is just accuracy in all possible contexts. Here we have two alternatives. We can say that empirical adequacy is we can replace all possible contexts with there is a very high probability that the model will be accurate. That's one way of doing it. And another way, which is a bit more ambitious, is to say the model is empirically adequate if it gets all the probabilities exactly right. Yeah, it's a bit more ambitious. But if we can go from one to the other by inference, maybe it's not problematic. So that's the two differences that we can use to adapt our previous uh, epistemology to the probability scale. And the third difference is that we need a story, we need to say something about model composition. Because probabilities can only be tested by making uh, composite models of sequences of events. And if we do so, we get this summary, which is an adaptation of this summary that I gave earlier. So it's, all, it's almost the same with only this replacement. So the idea that a context, <coughs> an epistemic context, where you will put to the test a model, is constituted of a situation of reference, a partition of coarse grain possibilities for this situation, so this is the same, and then you can add a risk threshold that tells you that uh, if probabilities are lower than this threshold, that it means that 
the model exclude this possibility and it can maybe depend on uh, an evaluation of risk we could go into there are pragmatic maybe pragmatic factors that come in at this point we can discuss this later then an applied model attributes probabilities to all the elements of your partition all the possibilities of your partition it is accurate if the possibilities which have a probability lower than your threshold are not observed. So if the models say that there is a probability uh, of 0 0.01 that your ball goes up, then you can consider that it's excluded because your threshold would be higher than this value. Yes? Excuse me, but suppose you have only three possibilities then you have a probability of probability. The threshold is one third. That's a not a low probability. So yes, you have conditions to, for this for this to be coherent. You have conditions on between your threshold and the number of probabilities. That's why I said the risk threshold must be lower than uh, uh, yes, but it must one be of much the lower in your case uh, because you have only three possibilities. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then you have to assume your threshold has to be lower than one third. Yeah, 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 okay. you, can, you could never get. Uh, mm -hmm. And so your apply model is accurate if the possibilities that are excluded are never observed. But of course, you cannot expect your model to be always accurate because it's a probabilistic model. Uh, in this sense of accuracy. So, then the, the notion of a theoretical model is just the same, it's a function from context to applied model. Let's say that it's adequate if it gets probabilities right in every possible context. Wherever you apply it, it gets probabilities right. So the probabilities correspond somehow to uh, the propensities of this situation. And then the question, the epistemological question <coughs> of justification is how can you know that your model, your theoretical model is adequate on the basis of accuracy. And as I said, you cannot expect your model to be always accurate. You have to assume that it's accurate most of the time. So, you can infer that your model is empirically adequate if it's mostly accurate in a large representative range of context. And here mostly, again, can be expressed in terms of uh, threshold. And this threshold will, will typically depend on the, the first one. Or the, the, yeah. <coughs> and the final clause is to account for the, this stuff about model composition. So, you have also to, to your model, you can infer that your model is empirically adequate if it's mostly accurate in large representative range of context, but also if all models that you could build from it by composition rules from the same or other models that are also accurate, uh, adequate, if all these composite models would also be accurate in most possible situations. And so this is uh, very close to the original uh, story given by model empiricism in the non-probabilistic case with just some adaptations. And it gives you an empiricist uh, epistemology for probabilities that fits quite well with uh, at least with the notion of severe test from uh, from uh, Mayo and Spanos. Uh, uh, and then one of the question is how much one question that maybe uh, I can ask you to help me answer is how much it's still empiricism in particular with this notion of modern composition and with these pragmatic factors that come in with the threshold. So this, this is an open question, how, how much we are somehow forced to depart a bit from a strict empiricism. 
to account for the possibility of knowing <coughs> probabilities. And that's it. So, do you want to take five take minutes? Five? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's. We could. We're out of half time, so I think we have time. Yeah. Okay. So.
Okay. All right. Yeah. Q and A. So, can I ask questions? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm probably missing something, but uh, I may have a question again about the uh, this notion of uh, risk threshold, because uh, I don't understand, you know, why you can say that uh, a model is accurate huh? if all models with a, a probability of below the threshold uh, are not realized. You mean not realized, in, you know, inductively in the long run, or something like that? Most of the time, because Most it's the time. you cannot say. But, that, but, but, uh, but that's not a very not a very stringent condition, is it? Uh, yeah, well, that, the example is yeah. you know, if there are three possibilities, <coughs> three possibilities, and uh, and then the the threshold is uh, <coughs> is, is one third. Yes. That's a pretty high probability. Yes, so, yes, but this is where the clause on uh, composite models uh, okay. can step in because, All of, right, of yeah. course, it's not very stringent if you if you only use your simple model. If you have a model of coin toss, let's say it's half-half, it will always be for every coin, single coin toss, you will pass the test very easily because it doesn't say much. But if you add this clause, then this clause on a composition, then you, for your model to pass the severe yes. test, it must also, uh, it must, uh, well, you will ex basically, it's, you will, if you can make a model of a hundred counters, and for your model to pass the test, it must have the right range. Yes, that was my next question, how do you reconcile that with the this uh, uh, close over there at the bottom. But why do you need that the risk threshold? Why do you need that? Because you cannot say that it will never fail. Uh, no. Because it's, it's a probabilistic model, so you always have a probability, even if the probability is low, it can happen. So you need a threshold to say, well, if it's lower than this, uh, I consider that my model. Uh, so, as you said, it's pragmatic. Is that, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that it's. I. I don't see how to avoid uh, this because at some point you have to make mm -hmm. pragmatic decisions when it comes to probabilities. It's. It's. It seems unavoidable. Yes, even if the probability is very low, it can happen. But. Uh, I still don't see, since the threshold can be very high, you know, I don't see that. Okay. But you can also have, a, when I say mostly, it's mostly accurate in the large range of context. You can have a, the kind of dependence between this mostly and the threshold that you're using. If you're using an easy threshold, it always passes the test, then you would. Yes. The mostly will be more stringent, and conversely, so you, you have a kind of uh, a trade off. Yeah, yeah a okay. trade off. Okay, 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 thank you. Uh, so I think it, it's related to the question of threshold, but so, so what in the, in the process make a difference between a probabilistic model and a deterministic model with exceptions? It's because of this threshold that you capture the notion of probability. Because in the data, it's, it's the same. A probabilistic model and result, and a deterministic model with a lot of exceptions that are just <laughs> the one you measure. So that's the well, threshold that yes. managed to make the difference. That's the deterministic the model, if it is really accurate and really adequate, it can, you would expect that it never fails. Because it's but with exceptions. It, if you accept exceptions, you're already in kind of, maybe it's not strictly no, probabilistic it's not, if, it's not, if it's not quantified. But, but it's not metaphysically the same at all. So it's why I ask you, is it the procedure is to capture probabilistic model or to differentiate or is this, you would say the same for 
for a model with exceptions that yeah. is not strict. Yeah, I would say the same, I, I, okay. I guess. Yeah, I, I would say the same, except that it's not quantified and that maybe ultimately you would like something quantified. Mm. But okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm good. What is the interpretation of propensity doing for you? Because uh, it appears, and <laughs> after that, this seems independent. Why do you need it? Uh, well, this is basically it appears there with the notion of adequacy. That to be adequate, what what it means for a model, a probabilistic model, to be adequate. I think that's where the the so you need, the, you the need an interpretation yes. for that Ad adequacy here means some kind of correspondence to okay. to to reality. Uh, don't have to doesn't have to be a metaphysical correspondence uh, of the realist, but some correspondence to the fact or something like that. So adequacy here is the the semantic notion, so to speak, I would say. And that's where the interpretation of probability matters, to know what exactly it means to be, for a probabilistic, to me, a probabilistic model to be adequate. If you have a frequency interpretation, adequacy means that your model reflects the ratio of events. If you have a disposition, a single case disposition probability, adequacy means that the probabilities reflect the single case propensities of every situation. Yeah, which, which you measure through probability, so you have never a way to know anyway. Well, the idea that you can know by inference, assuming, yeah. assuming that there are, okay. assuming the framework, assuming there are propensities and so on, single case propensities, if you assume the metaphysics behind, mm -hmm. then you can have this story that from experiments, it's possible to to make inference that because your models are that, adequate. Is that it seems to me that your reasoning, novel empirical probability, would work with very little adjustment to any interpretation. So why limit yourself to propensity? It seems that as an empiricist, you should leave the interpretation to philosopher. And say, okay, that's, if I yeah, can, maybe that's a method to test a probabilistic model. No? Maybe that's yeah. Maybe we that's something we should think about a bit more deeply. Whether what what difference it will make mm -hmm. exactly in the, then, in the uh, procedure? Yes, that's something we left open. We. Basically, we went for this interpretation because we thought that it was in the spirit of the original proposal of modern empiricism, which is focused on single situations, concrete situations that are instances. So that's why we went for it. But now, whether it could be compatible with other, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah. With best systems, for example. For example, yes. So yeah, I think that's something we should uh, maybe uh, we should say a bit more about this, I guess. Other questions? Sure. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I understand it enough to get this question to make it uh, like understandable or useful. But um, um, so these possibilities, how are they defined again? Sorry? You you mentioned possibilities all the time. How are they defined again? Remind me of how they are defined. The possibilities. Yeah. Uh, this is defined by uh, your context. So you have a. What do you mean? How they are defined? Yeah. What is a possibility? It's something that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But so, so so you say. Concretely, an applied model is accurate if the possibilities with probability lower than alpha are not actual. Um, but there is only one possibility that is actual. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, so. And it's, it, it cannot be, it must not be one of the possibilities with very low probability. Yeah. So if you toss a hundred coins, uh, 
your model of a sequence of 100 toss will say the probability to get 100 heads is very, very tiny. So this is uh, below your threshold. And so if, if you observe this, then your model is wrong. If you observe something that is given very low probability by your model, then your model is wrong. That's the basic idea. In this example, the, the n uh, possibilities are possible observed frequencies, right? Possible, sorry? Observed frequencies. If you do yes. this, if you uh, toss 100 times your coin, you can observe either uh, all heads or all uh, yeah. tails. Ta yeah. Or, uh, I don't know, 60%. That's the kind of possibility that you Yeah, possi the possibility. possibility, yes. There are possible frequencies. Yes. Okay. What is actual is a frequency in this case. In this case, where your experiment is a sequence of coin toss, your, what you observe is a, a set of results and uh, it has a frequency. Yeah. Okay. And your model tells you, say, that some of these. Some frequencies are impossible. So what is actually the frequency? So your question was a little bit, how do you know that some situation is a possibility? Um, no, that was not your Well, that, that's also a very good question. <laughs> um, because you have replied to that question. You know, the answer that you gave, that the captain gave, is the question, how do you know that uh, some situation is possible or not? It will, it you know it by experience. experience. Yes. By induction. That's your. Yeah. Okay. But the, so so you meant this notion of frequency as in I mean you confirmed uh, the while well, the frequency does nowhere um, occur in in the description. <coughs> The frequency does does not occur directly, but it's part of. Uh, okay, so if you are interested in a sequence of a hundred coin toss, how is it in plural? Tosses, toss, toss, tosses, tosses. Yeah. Oh, so you are interested in a sequence of a hundred tosses. Your possibilities and. You define your possibilities in, in function of your interests as an epistemic agent. And in this case, you could say the possibilities I'm interested in is whether there is one head or two head or three head in total. So the, your, your partition of possibility space in this case will be in terms will be cast in terms of frequencies. But it's a special case and that's why it doesn't appear here, but it's Implicit that among the your among the partition of coarse grain possibilities, you could have uh, a possibility that corresponds to having <coughs> such frequency of outcome, uh, having fifty, uh, having fifty uh, heads and fifty tails. It's it's one possible. It's one of your possibility. And the one with the highest pos uh, probability. Yes, right? exactly. So yeah. there are a lot of uh, possibilities with very low probabilities. Yes. If you Every frequency corresponds to one of your possibilities. But it's 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 a special case. I don't want to I don't want it to be only a story of how you get uh, you go from frequencies. I want it to be more general. So. But that's what confuses me uh, because. Like, if you think about frequencies, that gives you a very specific kind of probability, right? Um, one that is ideally objective and about frequencies, right? Well, I want to, uh, the problem is that you cannot identify, uh, fre there are a lot of problems with frequentist approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot really identify the frequency to a probability. Yeah, that's... Uh, right. you know, probabilities, for example, in quantum mechanics, they're not ratio, they're not rational numbers, so it's never a frequency, it's a real number. So if you go back to the interpretations of probabilities, then <coughs> you could have a limiting, limiting frequency, a hypothetical frequency, 
uh, theory to account for this, but it's it's always a bit complicated. I mean, frequentist interpretations are not very popular for this reason because it's not it's it's yeah, difficult to identify probabilities with actual world frequencies. You need okay, an infinite set. Uh, huh? The example you gave that I kind of understand now, but tosses yes is explained in terms of frequency. The frequency is the manifestation of your probabilities. Right, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's uh, yeah, if you think, uh, that's what Mauricio said. Mauricio has uh, arguments that, that are already known in the literature for why propensities cannot be identified with probabilities. This yeah. is in particular because uh, probabilities can be reversed. Way, Conditional part. probabilities can be reversed, but propensities are only in one direction. There are problems of this kind. Sure, so sure. you cannot identify the two, and then you cannot identify propensities to frequencies either. So the solution is to think of frequency, the frequency you get in one situation, one sequence of events, to think of it as a manifestation of the propensities. Roughly speaking, your sequence has a propensity to a very high propensity to display a frequency that is mild, that is in between 40 and 60. And where exactly in your model does this does this come up? Uh, the fact that it's, uh, the manifestations are frequencies, or where are the manifestations in this final model you have here? So it's implicit in this notion of composite models that among the composite models that you could build are models of a sequence of independent events. That's one kind of composite model that you could build. And this model, in order to test it, you can test it in terms of the frequencies that you would obtain. So that's a special case okay. of, uh, of a test. That maybe is, that is prominent, but it's a special case. That helps. Thanks. So, so I think I understood why you chose severe, te severe testing to, to build probabilistic empiricism, but it will exclude a lot of probabilistic model that we adopt without serial testing. So, so are you worried about that or do you think you will make the probabilistic empiricism a little bit looser later? Or? Uh, what testing, kind of serial testing, testing is tough. You know, it's a tough criteria. criteria. So what kind of models do you have in mind? But sometimes for, for a rare event, we put probability and we don't have much more data, but because of the history of the universe or because of other background knowledge, we say, yeah, it's probably that. And we do that regularly yeah. and we think we have good reason to do it. Maybe we, we don't, yeah. but... So one possible uh, answer to this is to say, uh, is to give some kind of rationale that if you have if your models if you have many adequate models that are tested independently, and if you make this composition stuff, mm -hmm. then you would get an adequate model too. So you, you would expect a compos uh, model that is kind of, that is built from adequate model to be adequate. So if for example, you have, can have a cosmological model that is. You cannot repeat the universe to test it many times, obviously, but you can be confident that it's adequate because it's based on a physics that is adequate. Uh, for example, for example, so you can maybe uh, you can have this rational this this idea that you your adequacy is based on uh, the adequacy of your building blocks. So, would you accept, for example, simulations as? A to build this uh, sequence of events, uh, so some some you know probability in the, in the, in the atoms disintegration, for example, and you say okay, yeah, for very very rare you know the very very uh, heavy elements that we don't have much quantities, but we say yeah we can simulate maybe, and so we get a good idea of what happen and uh, attribute a uh, outflight. 
Yeah, I don't think it gives an independent justification. I don't think. But with the empiricists, with for, for me, simulation is or if yeah. it's a simulation data. For me, simulation is just assi assisted uh, reasoning. It's not an experiment. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. So. So you would accept them or not? With the same rationale that, to the extent that your building blocks have been proved to be adequate, then this gives you prima facie good reasons to think that the more complex model that you've built is adequate too. But it's divisible and I, I would say that it's less, less certain, it's not, it's not as strong as the, the confidence you could have that a well-tested model is uh, adequate. It just gives you prima facie good reason to so think that there is no... So for you, it's, it's I don't want to push you more, but for you as an empiricist, the simulation is not an experiment. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of people saying exactly the reverse, you know. That. Yeah, but I completely disagree with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Charles? I have a, how to put it, different, different similar question. Um, does, I guess maybe the way to think about this, so, so this is where my brain went when I was seeing the, 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 severe testing slide. Does anything change in cases where, <coughs> where severe testing is just really hard? So like I was thinking about a point, like I was thinking about the following case. Uh, you know that I made two coins and one is biased at like 0.46 and one is biased at 0.49. And I shuffle them up and give you one and tell you. And so obviously, like a severe test now is like super hard, right? Because that's pretty fine, probabilistically speaking. Um, you want to you want to either say you you want to you want to have a model for what the coin's going to do, right? And there's two competitors. Um, and so yeah, so severe testing between those two is going to kind of suck. You're going to need like a crazy number of of, of trials. So um, in this case, the te what I want to to know is which coin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. You wanna, and you have, and you have two, two, com two competing models for which coin I gave you, yeah. right? Or for the behavior of the thing in your hand, maybe yeah. you can put it yeah, that yeah. way, yeah. right? Um, and yeah, so I mean, so that, I'm, just, I'm just, I was trying to think of a, of a simple example of a case where just it's just a severe test is just hard. Um, does that change anything, or is that is that are you willing to you're just you're just you're happy to just say you know look man whatever it's just it's just difficult science is hard. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> You don't. What else could you say? You don't know if you cannot. I mean, if you cannot, if you cannot make a difference, because in your in your example, the idea that the probabilities are very similar, right? Yeah. 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 So I guess what I was wondering so is about is about if you cannot know, you cannot know. I mean. No, but it's not you cannot know. It's that you cannot know with probability, but you could know by symmetry analysis or things like that. Right. So this is this is this is maybe where I, this is maybe where this, my question gets back closer to your question. But then you you need another model of the right. physical configuration of the coin, and it's right. another story. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But okay. Don't have that kind it's, of model. Uh, sorry. You don't have that. Kind but then you don't know. I mean, if you if you have a mean of knowing which coin is which, which coin, which of the two coins you have in your hand, that means that you you have some kind of model that makes a difference. I mean, how el how else could you know that it's this coin and not this one if you don't have some kind of model of representation of that makes a difference between the two coins and that but you can, can see the that symmetry of both is different, but I don't know which is which. Symmetry is different. So wait, but then I guess so then I guess maybe let me let me back up. So then the just to be to be to be super clear, so so you want to say there is still a fact of the matter about which single case propensity property the coin is, <coughs> right? This is just this is an interpretation about how you come to know what property is possessed by the object in your hand. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That helps too. Um, I was making sure that I had, that I wasn't yeah. confused. Yes. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, well, I think that's what Alexander wants to say. To have a, what he means is that suppose you have a laser device which gives you a very precise uh, form, you know, geometrical shape uh, of both coins. And on the basis of the, those, the difference of those shapes, you could decide, you know, what, you know, the, the amount of bias, you know, each coin possesses. But then I suppose that... You is that what you meant? Yeah, but it, it, my difficulty is where probability arrives. Because if I do an analysis of the coin, I can have a measure of propensity or something like that. Because it's all physical properties, symmetries, things like that. Where probability comes from, you know, in, in an empiric view. Because the way you, you talk is that probability comes from the moment. And I have a empiricist procedure to test models that have probability in them. But now we have another model I that think measure yeah. propensity directly or something like symmetry of the thing that have, of course, manifestation in possibilities of events, but not. I'm confused. Where are the problems? So I think the, <laughs> the, key, the key is that. Okay. So the propensity is basically it's part of it's what there is out there in the world, but in order to know the propensities, you need the the main idea that you need some kind of dichotomous claim mm -hmm. to test even for probabilities, mm -hmm. and so how it's how it works properly it's that your prop the it's as for the complex texts. The frequencies are a manifestation of your mm -hmm. propensities, and so that very yes, that's a downstream observation that you get, and that's how you test. That's where it comes from. I mean, you the worldly picture, the metaphysical picture, goes from there to there, down there, and the epistemological in the world. But why not defend best systems in that case? Uh, yeah, we're back to the maybe best systems works. Because well. it's more direct if you say, I have a technique to test probabilistic model. You know, best system is saying probabilistic model is the best way to modelize facts. So, yeah, so I agree that's a part that should be. Okay. Uh, Maybe I'm yeah. missing something. No, I mean, no, I mean, it's fair that there, there is something in this that is just assumed. Okay. We just say, okay, it's single propensities and propensities yield uh, frequencies, and uh, and then you can know uh, you can test your propensities from this. So this is just assumed, and I and, and I agree that you could wonder about why do you assume that and what. As an empiricist. Yeah, that's that's a fair question, and uh, and maybe I think we should think more about what difference would make a different uh, metaphysical picture. We should think about it, or we, and whether we can say less and say we test probabilities and whatever is behind we don't. Maybe I don't. That's something uh, we should think more deeply about. If I may, because uh, it, it seems to me that the metaphysical disposition mostly that you get to with your stuff are not mostly of the stuff themselves, you will start from the situation context, but mostly of your interaction with the stuff. So it's co construction of the system, mostly of the stuff themselves. Because you start from <coughs> contextual uh, possibilities and contextual probabilities of. So, uh, um, uh, so, what is the. No, so again? <laughs> I'm just too tired to understand the machines. Okay. No, yeah, I mean. But, but it, it seems to me that uh, since you, 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 your whole stuff was a semantic of models but contextual possibilities, in the end, what you get metaphysically are not the possibilities of the qualities of the stuff in themselves, but the possibilities of the qualities of the stuff as you interact with them, as you are in contact with them. So, so already like uh, a bit farther away from the base zone, more into an analytic kind of metaphysics stuff. Yeah, probably. But it's the same stuff as in your books. So, uh, yeah, yeah. 
So yeah, yeah because it's the probabilities are part of the theoretical models in the end. They are not. I mean, or maybe you could say. I would like to say that the dispositions or propensities are part of the theoretical model, and then when you apply it in a context, you get probabilities, and then, uh, or you, yes, you get probabilities for reasons, something like that. And in some cases, the probabilities are very high or very low, and as an experimenter, you would look for situations like this because they give you a way to say yes or no. That's the idea. Whereas when it's mild, when the model gives you mild probabilities, everything is possible and in the end you're not sure if your probabilities were right. Yeah, just a question on the criterion of severe testing that I, I don't fully understand. Let's suppose that you have a model uh, for the safety of a nuclear plant that says that Excuse me, can you speak louder? Yeah. Because I listen. Okay, yeah. S suppose you have a model for the safety of a nuclear plant that says that the probability of an incident is very, very low. But that one day is, it happens. Does it discard the model? Or, or just you can recognize that yes, the model said that it was very, very not probable, but it happens. So the probability <coughs> for the span of time where you yes. it was very very low, yeah. and it happens. I would say, yeah, it discards your model. Okay. I would say. Okay, because. But then, then then again, we go back to this idea of. Because there is a kind of coherentist picture behind to that that maybe is a bit uh, move a bit away from a pure empiricism uh, which is this idea that if you build a model from adequate model then it's probably adequate and so on and so maybe the failure of your model of your the full the whole plant the nuclear plant uh, would be discarded but is it enough to discard the basic model that you use to build it, maybe not, and then you can have this coherentist uh, reasoning that comes in to say, well, maybe it's just a rare event. So, so, so since I'm teaching this case, can I add something? <laughs> <laughs> so, mo risk model in nuclear are based on what we know about nuclear plants, but they are extremely complex, that's why they put probability of failure. When a failure arrived, they don't discard our, the model because most of the pieces of the model are known, but they they, they multiply, they, are, they increase the probability of risk by 10 or 15. It's, oh, it's not arbitrary because, but it's to take account the new, the new data. Yes. But they don't discard the model, but they change the probability. So it falsified the model in practice. Okay. But what you were saying is not. Yes. I mean, I, I think that in these kind of examples, we have uh, the confidence in the probability is not very high to start with because we have a very complex model and with lots of assumptions. And so I, I'd say basically the model is discarded. There is some assumptions that we made that was false in the model. We thought that there wouldn't be an interference there, there and there. We assumed this and eventually the, it, there was an interference or something like that. So I would tend to say that, that the model is discarded. Maybe not the building blocks, but uh, maybe something uh, went wrong in the assumptions that there is one, one of the assumptions was dis must be discarded, but we don't know which. But s suppose you have um, a theoretical model that, that says that the, the probability of a nuclear incident is alpha, and then you have a first applied model which said that in the next, I don't know, two years, the probability that it blows is very, very low. But a second applied model that says that in the 100 years ahead, 
the probability is not uh, negligible and it can mm -hmm. really happen. If it happens, the first model is discarded, but the second is not. That's right. If it happens, uh, I don't know if... It could be the same model, no? The same model could say both. But it's, but it's not the same It's not going model. to occur in 10 years. Oh, yeah, wait. Right. No. Yeah, I mean... In any case, I, I would tend to be skeptical about the probability assignments in such models. I don't think, I think it's a bit, uh, sometimes it's, it's not all one way, but how to say it's <laughs> nice than I English expression. A similar but example to be dices or coins or... I mean, if it... If you get stuck, you will become a rationalist. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, for example, the climate models, we have probabilities, but I don't think that they correspond exactly to real propensities of the Earth system. I, I, I would say there are guesses that are not too bad, maybe, but we are more or less confident. But I wouldn't say that the model of, the, of climate uh, modeling, I, I think we can be confident in what it says. It's not, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, climate sceptic or anything like that. Uh, I'm just saying that these probabilities are not, do not represent true propensities, exactly true propensities of the Earth system, of the atmosphere or anything. These are reliable guesses. So, so the, with these kinds of examples, I, I don't, I am not too worried because I think that this this does not really apply because it, because we are not in the business of establishing uh, real propensities of a system. We are more in the business of guessing. Uh, But is that different for physics something? Because uh, I don't see why it would be different for... Because we, the, we can make a severe test. It's can we in all cases? Because it's not a severe... Fire. I think the problem in this ki kind of cases, I think the problem is that we cannot make a severe test of four nuclear plants. Okay. That, 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 that's the problem. So the probability we have, we can be more or less confident because of our building blocks, because of indirect uh, inferences from the adequacy of what we put into the model, but it's not as strong as uh, as could be uh, a probabilistic model of a decaying atom, because in the case of the decaying atom, we can make severe severe tests. It's a question of robustness. It's, it, these models are not very robust. You, I mean, they are kind of robust, but uh, to a certain level. Could, could you do a severe test, a severe test for something that does not produce nice frequencies? Sorry? Uh, could you do a, a severe test for something that the, the probabilities is not, uh, does not produce frequencies because the events are super rare? Or is there a way to imagine a severe test and direct one or something? So, because here, here yeah, it, will, it will favor propensity that express themselves often. So I would. It's not part of our paper. So I speak uh, only on the, okay. uh, my name, <laughs> not on my co-author. But I have this idea that this picture is is quite general and yes, and it, it can be applied to this notion of. Robustness, yes, including when it's not a frequency test, uh, and that it would correspond to something that is called a corroboration. Sometimes, that when you 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 make an assumption and then you you test it from different means to access the same phenomena, and you see that there is kind of coherence. And I think that this kind of uh, like multiplying the circumstances where the different access to the same kind of stuff that you're hypothesizing. Uh, I, I think it can uh, fit in this picture in the sense that you ex by doing this, you exclude alternative models that would say, oh, but your story is just an artifact of this. So you could have an alternative hypothesis 
uh, in competition that would say, no, your model only works, is only artifactually correct <coughs> when you do it this way, but it wouldn't work if you do it this way. And my model would predict something different in this case. And then what you do is, is, a, is yeah, this kind of corroboration or triangulation and this kind of. But uh, when you exclude the model, okay, you exclude the model when you discard the model, when it assigns a probability uh, to uh, situations, and this probability is extremely low. And this situation do not occur, right? Uh, does occur when you find it. The situation does not occur. All right. But now, um, I think we have to, to distinguish between the probability that uh, of a situation that is uh, assigned by a model and the probability that the model is correct. You okay. Uh, so. And you see, to infer then that the, uh, since the probability is very low <coughs> according to the model and the situation never occurs, then the model is discarded, so it's incorrect. So it's a, it's a yes or no situation. Yeah. So, personally, I don't believe uh, in degrees of prudence. I don't think there are anything like degrees okay. of prudence. I know it's a minority view, but mm. I, I think it doesn't exist. We don't have degrees of prudence in the head or anything okay, like okay, that. Okay. So, uh, and yeah, as, uh, assigning probabilities to models, uh, I don't really believe in that. I think science is in the business of saying this, of eliminating post models. But discarding them, but not attributing. No, I, I tend to agree with you, but you know, I just wanted to ask a question. Yeah. To make sure. I, I was wondering whether um, the, the cardinality of the possibilities, of the set of possibilities, is um, in any way relevant here. Like the kind of cases we were discussing is, is like finite number of possibilities. Uh, but then you can wonder whether you can have countable. Uh, but in the cases that are more common, it will be uncountable. Uh, like when it's a, it's a, like just a distribu distribution distribution over the uh, all the real numbers. Uh, you know, you don't have a, a you don't the probability is not over a, a finite or uncountable uh, number of possibilities. It's really they are spread out. In no, the as in the theoretical model, not in the applied one. Yeah, ah, yeah, that's the trick. Yeah, you were on the jury of the dissertation, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. Yes, that's a trick. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's your trick. <laughs> it's not a trick. It's experiments are. We always have finite information, so from experiments. But there could be something there. There could be some mismatch. We can imagine. Because in the theoretical model, imagine something that is defined on a very bizarre measure, you know, the big stuff or something. Yeah. And in the measure, you have to become finite. So you have to cut maybe something important, like pass from a dense set to an undense set or something. But you still want to prove the model with the complex structure. Mm, that's a good point. So how, how should I? Should um, imagine something weird, like the model is defined on the rational, but not on the irrational. So it's one on the rational, <laughs> and there's a, <laughs> between zero and one. And these are probabilities. So there's a, a certain probability to have, if you are in the rational position... On like a grid, density, a probability density? or Yeah, something like that. So, okay. so you have... Uh, the thing could exist, could be uh, on the rational on the grid, but zero in the irrational on the grid. But <laughs> it's that's testing. your model, and you have good reason that it's true. That's what are you good reasons? But you haven't tested it. How, how do you do that? I think it's untestable. You cannot have good reason that it's... <sighs> oh. <laughs> Why not? You know, because there could be model like that. Why? Why would you need that? It's untestable. You know, we, we believe in the direct function and all kind of weird 
weird stuff that appeared yellow. Yeah. That bizarre measure. But how how would you test? If you I have exact I'm asking you, you know, you're yeah, a So you have a model that you have a function that is only defined on rational numbers, but not yeah. real numbers. Not irrational one. Not irrational uh, yeah. numbers. But that could happen. And then you have another alternative model that is exactly the same, but it interpolates between yeah. Yeah. It's the same, I mean, the same model. <laughs> oh, it's even the same model. No, not for mathematicians. That's really. <laughs> oh, well, that's interesting. Because if you say it's the no, same yeah. theoretical it's a way of, model, it's that's a way, interesting. It's a way of speaking. I mean, it's a different mathematical structure, but I, even for, for I don't think it's physically, it makes a... F I, f I don't think it makes an empirical difference, and so I don't think it makes sense to believe in one and not in the other. I can't see any reason to but believe it's in one and the, the other. The point is how you define an empirical difference. So, so if you, there's an indirect in terms path of context, that makes a difference in a context, you would say, okay, because you said you give that answer to shall before. Yeah. But to test it directly, maybe it if you have a finite means, means it's it's not possible. So enough. yeah, I, I okay. I'm a bit skeptical, but maybe if you if, you, if there were an example where it would make an indirect empirical difference to have one or the other, I I can't think of why it would make a difference that the function is defined or not on irrational numbers. But but if you can show me an example from a but think about the imaginary example where it makes a the different thing. interpretation of quantum mechanics define probability in a different way, would you say it's the same model? Yeah. Well, it's it's yeah. Even if they define probability in a different way, because they are not, I you cannot differentiate it I, I, that number. I still consider myself an empiricist and. Particular, I can, I would accept to call myself a realist if, in the pragmatist sense, if you don't assume some kind of spooky okay. uh, correspondence truth. Okay. And then my answer would be, yeah, if one model is true, the other is true as well, because it doesn't make, see if it doesn't make uh, concrete differences for any possible experience, then it's if one is true, the other is true in my conception of truth. So. That's what I would say. But okay. that's that's my that's not the view of my culture. Sorry, I said you would. And so we're deriving a bit from the topic. But if, if you are testing this uh, derived, then it makes a difference for a scientist which one you would do. <coughs> so, so it makes not not empirical difference, but it makes a pragmatic difference. So if you're going to pragmatics, uh, I, you have taken I remain a bit skeptical if you can show me uh, this kind of an example with a concrete difference. I would I, maybe I would accept it, I don't know. I, I want to see a, a concrete example. Yeah. <laughs> so we still have like a five minutes, I think? I yeah. have a follow up on that sure. point. But in the evaluating um, models seem to be important. I mean, and, 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 um, so if you really just look, if you really just evaluate a model by its outcome, like pure mathematical uh, or quantitative outcome, um, it seems to me that the theoretical background of it, that is really doing the work, uh, can be completely different <coughs> when the outcomes are the same. But which one you choose could be super important to keep your whole world view uh, coherent. Kind of, you don't want to discard a model um, if it has other purposes for other kind of uses just uh, um, that w that are not like of the same kinds uh, but yeah but, uh, yeah I mean you but it's it's always the same uh, problem that uh, you assume that it would make a difference that it would be incoherent with a certain worldview and I would like to see a concrete example where it would no, I mean, I mean, <coughs> of uh, maybe two worldviews, two different worldviews. One is 
one which is compatible with your model that is only defined on rational number, and one one view as big as you want that is only compatible with the model that is defined everywhere. And I would like to yeah I would like to see where it makes it well the two world view make a difference. Yeah, but this is not exactly the same question that I wanted to ask. Um, suppose it does make a difference for other applications, so completely different applications yeah, that use the same kind of theoretical model. Um, and for one, it gives uh, um, other outcomes, uh, and for or but and how? for another application, it gives. Uh, uh, the same outcomes, you know, it, it's not... Um, How can you... I, I mean, so, so just the individuation of a model by its outcomes... So you have, the, you would have a kind of detector of, in reality, you have some kind of detector that would react one way when it's a rational number and the, another way when it's... Well, it's, it's spooky, but... but it may, uh, okay, in, in, a com in a big cut empirical context, you cannot differentiate if light is particles or light is wave. Mm -hmm. However, the fact to assume maybe light is wave is important for another part of science that seems better there to use wave than in the empirical context. Yeah. Blah blah blah. So you see, in a re when you define models by what they produce in a context. There's a danger that you lose the idea of backgrounds that maybe are used somewhere else in science, maybe in chemistry. It could be quite far. Well, yeah, that, that's <laughs> what I intend to and very far. These background assumptions that are in theoretical model, not in applied model, but in theoretical model. So, so the point of, of Peter was, is it a good idea to individuate model by their outcomes only? That's what's your yeah. question. You will lose this practice of science. But that's the anti-realist part of my views that I don't think it's... I think Sorry. that's the non-realist part of my personal views that in this kind of case I wouldn't be... I wouldn't think that it corresponds to... I would be very skeptical that this very abstract structure have any correspondence to the world. I would say, what if... <coughs> what if in a hundred year... Uh, all this collapses because there is a new scientific revolution, and so uh, I, I would be skeptical, basically. So maybe it's it would be it's disappointing for you <laughs> this kind of answer, but I would say, I mean, these are useful useful fictions if it makes it's, no, it makes your worldview more correct. The point, the just point keep is, it. Uh, the point is how much of the practice you want to recuperate, and which one you are ready to say fictions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I've you have everything, but if you're talking, still talking about the idea of severe testing, and the Mayo stuff, she limits to experimental knowledge. She cast away with what is theoretical, that's part of the severe testing stuff, but we're only testing the experimental hypothesis. So you don't care about the background theories at all. Yeah, and that's not a I think it makes sense for, for a view. That's not a problem that you. But so then you don't have to, to bother about to, to think about. The application of the uh, data context. No, no, but, but but then you like simplify science enormously. Yeah, I mean she that's what, that's what she does at least. Well, yeah, but I, your picture seems to want to be quite general, right? So can you yeah. just like take a very specific simplification as kind of the the thing that completely found uh, as the foundation of, of of your system, your approach? You want something that is absolutely general, right? Mm -hmm. So if there is this presupposition and it doesn't com uh, correspond to scientific practice, to completely discard uh, the theoretical backgrounds, I mean, that seems to be. It's part of one thing. It's, it's, it's not that does not discover most of. She just think that the scientific practice is ultimately experimental. And uh, but everything that is done theoretically is another kind of like uh, some, some part of uh, the of practice that she tries to capture the idea of self testing. But uh, you could have other part of other epistemological test for practices. But, but, yeah. but I, I mean, scientists are very, uh, sometimes they have 
they handle very different pictures and they don't see a problem of incompatibility. You have the, like in quantum mechanics, you have the Heisenberg picture. So whether you assume that your particle is uh, static and what you measure evolves with time, or you assume that your particle is moving and uh, what you measure is always the same. And the physicists say, it's the same. We don't care about the difference. But it's metaphysically, it's different, isn't it? So, so I don't think it goes against what I'm saying. I don't think what, that what I'm saying goes against scientific practice in the sense that, in general, maybe not all, but many physicists just <coughs> don't care about which picture of two are true or not, if in the end the applied model will say the same in every possible context. At least in physics, uh, and they don't care about, uh, I mean, some care, but many don't care about Bohmian mechanics or that kind of stuff, I because think they, because they, think, they think it's it's the same in the end. So. It's not because physicists are stupid. <laughs> yeah, I think we should it's justify it. I agree, yeah, but I agree with them in this case. Just I don't think they're stupid. It's just institutionally, the lab for physicists for and the lab for experimentalists are different. So can you even... Yeah, I mean, that's the same practice. For years, we checked theoretical physics and we said, okay, it's too far from practice, we don't take it account. And now you have you guys and you know, practice and experimental. But all the practice of theoretical physics, garbage, fiction, blah, blah, maybe it's. I hope the, the thing will come back to the center. <laughs> <laughs> because maybe we were bad before, you know, reading and theory, ontology. But now it seems that you're just putting in the garbage most of what science, theoretic, theoretical physicists have. No, no you're just screwing your head like that, but you are. <laughs> but when, when, when did? I, I don't think I don't think physics changed that much in this respect. I think it has always been like that, more or less. Uh, empirically driven. And empirically driven with this assumption that that uh, if it doesn't make, uh, if your hypothesis cannot make a practical difference, then you don't have to care about which is true. I think it's something that has no, always don't care about existed. It's true, but there's complete theory that has been discarded because they were not beautiful. Yeah, it's not, not and that, Now it's garbage. I mean, we can go in. And we all, should all the all the use of. There's a lot more use of probability in physics than what you can test by severe stuff. I don't Garbage. know. Garbage. I don't know. Yeah, but then you're not going to be racist if you take this type of stuff into account. It's part of no, the non biased part of classification in science. No, no, I'm not that sure of this, but uh, we should uh, maybe take it. If, if you take it seriously I'm and make I'm, I'm empirical philosophy of science and go see uh, sure. uh, historical cases uh, to see who is right among us, but maybe you're right. But, uh, but, but Mauricio is I'm writing not. a very nice paper about the epistemology of Maxwell, which is pretty complicated. <laughs> I mean, in, the, in these times, in the uh, end of 19th century, physicists barely believed that they were atoms. So, I mean, because they, don't, they didn't have the it's not about, But it's not about atoms, but it's about, for example, some would say, if you don't have a mechanical model, you don't have an explanation. And that was what Maxwell said at the beginning. And progressively, he went away from this conception and he changed. And all that is true data fix, you know, the only practice of theoretical of what is an explanation, what is, and that's, that's not empiristically accessible, that's not justify empirically, of course, that's the same prediction, but that's part of science, that's mm -hmm. important, yeah. Well, I'd like to, maybe we, we should discuss uh, an example, uh, because a concrete example in the details to see. But the Maxwell equation is a concrete example. So what was put in garbage? So Lord, Kev Lord Kelvin says the Maxwell equation are great, but if you don't, if you're not, if you don't incarnate that in the mechanical model, they are no, they are not explanatory, but they are cool. And that was, and progressively Maxwell went away from this position and said mathematics is enough. Yeah, but that's a kind of position I defend. 
but that's and you don't have to make the same same base. It's just discussion about you don't have to assume uh, some to make you don't have to assume uh, mechanistic metaphysics if the maths and uh, corresponds to the prediction. It's fine. That's no, but it's a metaphysics. I, mean, I agree with Max Weber. But case. it's a metaphysics to say the math is enough because the math the no, does it's it pragmatic. represent ether? Does it represent feel? Does it, there's already a, a, metaphysic, a, a metaphysical discussion, and it's all metaphysical discussion, and they, it was the same data, absolutely the same. But and at some point, and, and at some point, point, they decided that it doesn't matter how we interpret it. The math is enough. Either. We just need an empirical interpretation. You know, now you're just trying to get your position from what I say. You know. But no, it's. <laughs> I think it's different communities, different rules of uh, justification. But, so but this idea is that there's a part that is not captured by the empiricists. It's about other aspects of science. So if you define models individually then by your outcome, you will lose this discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, I agree that there is kind of unificatory uh, objective in science to have unified representation. I, I completely agree with this, but I won't go uh, very further than this. I mean, unification, you don't want just to record uh, data there, data there, data there, and just compile data. That's not science. I, I, I agree. If that's the point, I agree. You want some kind of framework that unify the various uh, data that you can get in various contexts. And that's part of the story that the theoretical model is unificatory because it's a function from context to context. So it must unify somehow a range of context. But that, so if that's the point, that it's not a pure empiricist that would just compile observation, I, I agree. But I won't go further than, than that, say what, what what science makes is a uh, yeah, mathematical structure that can be applied in all possible contexts in a unified way. And I won't go further than this. Okay. I mean, it's good. I think we. It's time for the